From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. Noel, you came to us with a story that I don't, I don't know if you had heard this, Matt. It was new to me. Uh, I was incredibly surprised, and I think a lot of our listeners will be uh, surprised because this is about a work of art that pretty much everyone knows, right? Everyone's seen the screen, mm-hmm. even, if they, even if they didn't know it was called that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's even been uh, immortalized in an emoji. There, there is, mm-hmm. the, the, you know, that whole hands on face. Oh, my God. Emoji is, is absolutely a, a nod uh, to Edvard Munch's The Scream. And, and the, uh, the entire horror franchise of The Scream is mm-hmm. almost, you could say, completely based on that face. You know, I, 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 you jest there, Matthew. Uh, but I will say that the look of the Scream figure with the elongated mouth and the kind of wavy, wibbly wobbly features really reminds me of a lot of Japanese horror tropes uh, like um, uh, Junji Ito, for example, where a lot of Japanese ghosts have these slack jawed kind of terror, like existential staring into the abyss kind of uh, expressions on their face or, you know, the, the big gotcha moment in the uh, ring, the American remake, when the body in the closet, it's, its mouth is kind of like, you know, op- like this gaping kind of maw of, of terror. Uh, to me, a, a lot of that is inspired by the scream. And and that's the thing about this painting, right? I mean, anyone who, okay, don't want to leave anybody out, just it's, a, you know, it's got kind of a, Oh, let's say a Van Gogh-ish quality to the look of the sky. Everything's a, it's a surrealist painting, obviously, um, but it's a bridge, and you can see a couple in the background walking. The sky's very uh, wavy, colorful, kind of like um, bands of uh, oranges and blues, and kind of amber uh, and light blues. And there's the sea in the background, but everything's kind of twisting off at this weird vanishing point. And in the foreground is this kind of wavy figure. Uh, yeah, you're right, Matt. The the mask in the movie Scream definitely clearly based on this as well. Uh, but yeah, hands on face a-, a la Macaulay Culkin in Home Alone, which, by the way, that never made sense. Uh, aftershave doesn't burn unless you've cut yourself. It doesn't just burn your face. I just wanted to point that out really quick. Uh, well, that well, never sat, that never sat well with me. Yeah, well, we don't know what was in the aftershave. The franchise is entirely about taking innocuous things and making them weapons of death and destruction. That's a very good point. You never know. Uh, Could have run in the family. But yes, the surrealist painter Edvard Munch uh, painted this in, I believe, 1893. Ben, isn't that right? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, The original German title was Der Schrie der Nature. Uh, the scream of nature. The scream of nature. That is some Werner Herzog stuff right there, where he's like, you you hear the sound of the birds and you think they're singing. They're really just screaming in terror. You know, it's a very German kind of dire. Uh, what's the word? Nihilistic kind of perspective, right? The scream of nature. Uh, but Edward Munch came by the this kind of existential dread. Honestly, uh, mental illness ran in his family, especially with his sister. Um, He was Norwegian, and he talked often about the relationship between his mental health uh, and and his work. Uh, He was reported to have suffered from hallucinations, uh, a nervous breakdown, agoraphobia, depression, you name it, a laundry list of of these kind of maladies. And he said of this relationship, uh, my fear of life is necessary to me, as is my illness. Without anxiety and illness, I am a ship without a rudder. My sufferings are part of myself and my art. They are indistinguishable from me and their destruction would destroy my art. And this was written in one of his journals. Uh, Illness, insanity, and death were the black angels that kept watch over my cradle and accompanied me all my life. Wow. Yeah. It was dark stuff. Um, But here's the thing that I didn't know. Edvard Munch apparently uh, painted four different versions of the Scream. Um, And 
on one of them, this is something that's been known for a long time. This part isn't the isn't the mystery. Uh, there was well, it is the the source of the mystery. Uh, there was a, an inscription that just just reads simply, "Could only have been painted by a madman." Um, and and this has been a conversation in art circles, uh, you know, for for a long time. Whether this was some kind of graffiti uh, that was done while it was on display, or uh, or her, who knows what, what, where this came from? One popular idea was that it was vandalized uh, by someone that didn't like the piece, or that, that it was meant to be an insult. You know, like like what is this trash? This could only have been painted by a, someone who has a sick mind. You know, something like that. Um, and and there had been talk from the start that the uh, that that Munch had done it himself, uh, but now some new kind of more deep analysis of the work has proven that it was, in fact, Munch himself who wrote this. Uh, it's written in pencil, um, and it's really hard to see just by looking at it up close. Theory Ford, who is the painting's conservator at the National Museum of Norway, made a statement about this discovery. Through a microscope, you can see that the pencil lines are physically on top of the paint and have been applied after the painting was finished. Um, but it wasn't clear when or why this happened. Um, and yeah, again, this is just one of four versions. The other ones have no such inscription. Um, so, you know, I don't know. It's, it's not like a deep, deep mystery, but I just I think it's interesting. I, I think the uh, it's an interesting excuse to talk about the intersection of mental health uh, or illness um, and art. And also, I just love a good hidden message, you know, and I love a good hidden message mystery. Um, but yeah, this guy, um, my Brit uh, Golang, who's the curator at the National Museum of Norway, and his team used infrared photography to make the um, the de the definition in the pencil marks a lot clearer, and then they were able to do a handwriting analysis and compare it to those diaries that I was reading from earlier. Um, so they, it turned out that it was uh, none other than the artist himself that had, uh, whether whether as a critique of his own work or whether like as a comment on his own, you know, mental health or, or what. Um, but it's interesting. And, and Guling said the writing is without a doubt Munch's own, the handwriting itself, as well as events that happened in 1895 when Munch showed the painting in Norway for the first time, all point in the same direction. Yeah, yeah. So interesting thing about this inscription, and I agree with you, coded messages are super cool. Uh, I'm obviously very into those. Uh, this inscription was first noticed way back in 1904, but like you said, Noel, they had no idea who wrote it, why. Was it just some jerk handling the painting who was like, hey, 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 hey upper left-hand corner? Uh, but what the team you're talking about what they did with that infrared photography conclusively proves based on other extant handwriting that this was munch himself and he probably uh probably was reacting adversely to criticism uh which i th i think they they were even able to find the time right did we say that 11 years about 11 years after the painting was made 1893 when it was exhibited in Norway at the Blomquist gallery um, and yeah it, it absolutely drew some pretty nasty criticism because at the time I mean it was uh, pretty radical you know it was it was a very you know it was not the classical style that that would have been uh, preferred um, especially in that part of the country not that Norway is the same as Holland but it's close enough to that part of the country where you had this focus on like the masters and you know the, uh, the the Dutch masters and and technique and all of that and this is much more of a uh, radical kind of uh, approach very psychedelic and distorted view of the world. And yeah, this art critic, Henrik Grosch, uh, wrote that this painting was proof positive that people should not, quote, consider Munch a serious man with a normal brain. Well, Ouch. Normalcy, <laughs> normalcy is a myth Absolutely. that has done a lot of damage uh, simply by uh, the convenience with which the definition of normalcy is changed in any given society at any given time. Um, Can you imagine wow. just a world full of completely fine, mentally stable artists? Everyone's just, everyone's fine. 
No one has problems. No one has a backstory rife with pain or anger. I'm sorry. I felt myself slipping into a coma imagining that world just out of boredom. (laughs) Well, I think, um, you know, everybody listening to today's show and all of us making today's show uh, should consider ourselves very fortunate to live in a time when mental illness is increasingly destigmatized. Because one thing that I believe hurt Munch intensely was not just the allegations of his own mental state, uh, but that they were uh, his his negative feelings were exacerbated by the known mental illness struggles of other members of his family. And this stuff can run in families. So it's, um, I don't often say it, but the species has come a long way, I think, in uh, handling of mental uh, conditions. We've touched on some of this in previous episodes of the show or in previous segments, but any anybody listening out there, you know, we're not blowing smoke when we say this stuff is important and you do need to make yourself a priority. Uh, also, nobody really has all the answers. I, I, I don't know if we all agree, but I'm, I'm saying that normalcy is to a large extent a made up thing. It's a social fiction. It really reminds me of this David Bowie lyric from the album The Man Who Sold the World. There's a song on it that's fantastic. It's kind of a deep cut. It's called All the Mad Men. And there's a lyric that says, Because I'd rather stay here with all the mad men than perish with the sad men roaming free. And I'd rather play here with all the mad men, for I'm quite content they're all the same as me. It kind of brings a tear to my eye, actually, because it's powerful stuff you know it's like the idea of sanity and madness and that that continuum yeah it's absolutely a myth and anyone that can see the world in a different way used to be considered insane and now uh we call it something different well also let's consider that there were people there's very compelling evidence that throughout human civilization uh people were sometimes lauded uh, for things that would be understood to be mental conditions these days, you know, oh. with the soothsayers, oracles, Absolutely. prophets of old. Uh, but we have to remember for every one or two of those kinds of cases, there were hundreds, if not hundreds of thousands of other people who were stigmatized, persecuted, isolated, chased out of town. Like, look at the trial of Peter Stumpf, who seemed to genuinely believe he was uh, a werewolf that that's like if you saw that in a court today your first thing to your first move whether prosecution or defense would be to go for a psych eval wouldn't it yeah no doubt no doubt um and just just really quickly to wrap this up um according to this really great article that i think broke the story uh, in the live science or anyway it was one of of just a few places that i saw this but by far the the most in depth um around that same time that that art critic uh, henrik grosch said those not particularly nice things about Munch's mental state. Um, there was a student society in uh, Cristania that had like a forum devoted to discussing the art of Edward Edward Munch, and there was a lot of positive feedback. You know, um, there you know students were going to be the first ones to the table as far as like you know interesting, more cutting edge stuff usually. Uh, but then there was a, a medical student named Johann Scharfenberg who openly questioned Munch's mental state. Um, And it's believed that Munch was there and took this very personally um, and and wrote about it often in his letters and his diary um, after that for, for quite a few decades. And he was concerned about hereditary diseases um, and and the the inheritance of these traits. Uh, And he he was concerned that he was going to be on the decline as he got older. But according to Guling, the curator at the National Museum of Norway, uh, he says the theory is that Munch wrote this comment on the painting after hearing Scharfenberg's judgment on his mental health sometime in or after 1895. It's reasonable to assume that he did it quite soon after, either during or following the exhibition in in Cristania. So he basically defaced his own painting. Uh, Well, whatever, call it what you will. But he didn't do it like as part of the, you know, initial design. It was it was something that he kind of did almost as a little F you kind of, or perhaps a self 
criticism. I'm, I'm really not sure, but an act it's of certain, self-harm. Yeah. Exactly. An act of, that's exactly right, Ben. Uh, but it certainly, um, according to Gulong, and I completely agree, uh, really showed and expressed his vulnerability and his insecurity and his introspection. And there are two, you know, we see this happen in the arts. Um, it, it's not infrequent. You know what I mean? That somebody might burn their novel in the days before digital writing uh, became preeminent, or someone might deface their own sculpture, their own painting, and so on, or destroy the music they have created, because this is a very uh, sensitive part of anybody, any person's psyche. And I would argue, too, that uh, there is a tendency towards some people, for a number of reasons, to resent creative work by someone that they know. There's something about our species that likes uh, works of genius or works of you know profound creativity at a remove. You know what I mean? Even even things that aren't necessarily you know brilliant. Like uh, people like to think of celebrities as not real people, but people that are on the internet over there. You can't see in the camera frame, but I'm throwing my right arm way, way off camera. Um, so it always reminds me of this, um, this Emerson quote that I, that I find so, so appropriate for this. In every work of genius, we recognize our own rejected thoughts. They come back to us with a certain alienated majesty. And I think that's something that art communicates very well. You know, art speaks to people and it's telling you something that uh, in some way you experience yourself. So anyway, sorry, word, no, word no. salad, it's, rambling. No, and you guys are making great points. I <laughs> just think it's amazing on. that Ever Munch wrote the perfect sarcastic clapback tweet onto his own page. <laughs> yes. Right. Yeah, yes. Yes. We did. He got the character. Uh, it's a it. subtweet, is what they call those. <laughs> little, little known fact. Yeah, uh, Twitter is based on this uh, coded message by lunch. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. nobody ever reads their about page. You know, um, w one important note though, I do feel like we should add whenever we talk about things uh, of this nature is without being sanctimonious. Uh, please remember, if you yourself are struggling in in some way, there are resources out there. They are available. You can stop this podcast now if, if you wish. Uh, we hope that you pick it up later. Uh, and you can call 1-800-273-8255. That's 1-800-273-TALK. Uh, it's, it's the 24-7 contact line for Mental Health America. If you happen not to be in the U.S. listening to this, your country probably has a call in line like this because they are so very important. So do take advantage of them. Uh, do not hesitate. Uh, there are people there for you.